Good afternoon and welcome to the final public event of the Religious and Psychological Wellbeing Project hosted by the Center for the Study of Religion and Psychology of the Danielson Institute at Boston University. For the past three years, with generous funding from a Templeton Research Lectures grant from the Metanexus Institute, a dozen of us here at the university have been meeting to discuss um, the intersection of religion and science and how that informs well-being. And each year we've invited an eminent speaker to give a series of lectures, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Barbara Fredrickson. She is the Keenan Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she's also director of the Positive Emotions and Psychophysiology Laboratory. In addition to psychology, she is an adjunct professor of management in the UNC School of Business. Professor Fredrickson received her BA from Carleton College and her PhD in psychology from Stanford University. And before coming to North Carolina, she taught at Duke and the University of Michigan, where she was also a professor of both psychology and business. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Templeton Prize in Psy Positive Psychology from the American Psychological Association. Dr. Fredrickson studies and writes about many things, but primarily positive emotions and gender studies, and she's deeply interested in connections between psychology and physiology. She is a prolific writer, having authored or co-authored over 60 articles, 27 book chapters, 17 smaller pieces such as encyclopedia entries and book reviews, two editions of an introductory psychology textbook, 13 other publications currently in various stages of preparation, and last but definitely not least, she's recently published this book, Positivity, uh, published in 2009 with Crown Publishers. And the cover features a very nice quote from Martin Seligman, who many people consider the founder of the modern empirical study of positive psychology. Dr. Seligman, Seligman said, Barbara Fredrickson is the genius of the positive psychology movement. Well, <laughs> how did you feel when you read that quote? <laughs> <laughs> With a background like that, perhaps it's not surprising that this week alone, she's given five lectures. This will be her fifth lecture in three cities. I first heard her speak in the 1990s at a conference in Denver. And I remember thinking at the time, she had really hit on a key idea that just made so much sense. And in the time since then, Many people have, uh, have uh, conducted studies that have confirmed the various parts of the theory. And it's just been a delight to see how this has grown, how your lab has grown, how the people that have worked with you have taken this in various directions. But that kind of success takes a lot of time. And so she also wanted me to say that she, we have her on loan from her long-suffering and very patient family, who first put up with her writing the book, and now then the publicity tour, and now all of these speeches. So we have her on loan from seven-year-old Crosby, 10-year-old Garrett, and her husband of many years, Jeff Chapel. Her overall theme for the Templeton Research Lectures is how positivity seeds character development, spiritual transformation, and lifestyle change. She's already presented the first five lectures, which were videotaped and will be available online soon. This lecture is also being videotaped and will be available online. And so let me say a word for those of you who are joining us for the first time. There are two microphones. And for the sake of the videotape and the people who will be watching this over the internet, if you would wait to ask a question until you're standing at the microphone and recognized, that will allow the people watching the tape to actually hear your question, which will allow them to actually understand the answer. So thank you for helping us in that way. So this is a bittersweet moment because this is not only the end of your time with us, but it's the end of this three-year project. And so I'd also like to thank all the members of the Templeton Research Project who've been part of this for three years. So without further ado, Dr. Fredrickson. Thank you for the introduction. Um, there was one time num a number of years ago where Marty Seligman introduced me with that G word and uh, I just about uh, uh, just blushed beyond compare, and I just can't take that word too seriously. But um, it's the kind of things that publishers like to put on books. So anyway, thank you for mentioning it. Um, my talk today is my effort to summarize a lot of the 
building block pieces that I've presented over this series, this lecture series, and to put it in a broader perspective in a way that helps us understand character de development and spiritual transformation, and more generally, how do people change their lives for the better. So um, uh, what I want to do is uh, pull together a number of these building blocks in a, in a, at a quicker pace and then assemble a, a larger picture. So again, when I'm speaking of positive emotions, I just want to reinforce that there are a wide range of positive emotions that uh, count here as being active ingredients in, in helping us um, uh, change for the better, become the best versions of ourselves. There's the jump for joy uh, moments that um, may be most prototypic in our minds. There are also quieter moments of gratitude where uh, people are construing their um, immediate context as <coughs> gifts to be treasured and that uh, those feelings of, of uh, great appreciation um, also uh, are count as uh, instances of positive emotion. There's also serenity, you're feeling deeply connected to your current circumstances, interest, being fascinated with the world around you. Um, I use this one to uh, describe hope um, in dire circumstances, feeling like there's still a possibility for good and positive change. Uh, pride, uh, specifically uh, attributed to uh, achievements sharing amusement and laughter with friends and loved ones, being inspired by the visionary uh, uh, language and um, uh, f future potential that others offer, feeling awe at the great mysteries of life, the great beauties of the earth, and feeling love, closeness, and, and trust with others. So I, as I just wanted to go through all these instances of positive emotions one more time, again, um, I think each of these forms of positive emotions is really vital to who we can become in the future. So uh, sometimes you'll hear me just say positive emotions, and I want to let you know that all of these uh, different types of positive emotion, and per perhaps more than these 10, um, are really vital. Um, I have a special take on love, and I usually present love last in this list because I see it as any of the other types of positive emotions experienced in the context of safe and close relationships could be redescribed as love. So when positive emotions are experienced in social context, um, in, within warm and safe relationships, you can redescribe that as love, whether it's interest, amusement. Um, uh, pride, awe, all those things could be um, re-described as love. And that view of looking at love as an amalgam of other positive emotions is not unique to me. There are other emotion theorists who um, uh, view it that way. Carol Lazard, in particular, is who I draw from here. There are also some very interesting properties of positive emotions that really require uh, and emotions in general, but um, my specialty is positive emotions, that require us to look at them as part of uh, a broader system, a broader system where there's um, reciprocal causality between um, different aspects that helps us, can help us understand how uh, they can be a, a critical ingredient in igniting growth, okay? So, um, part of the, the system, of, of reciprocal causality is this notion of upward spirals, and that is that certain aspects of positive emotions trigger some other uh, phenomena, which in turn triggers more positive emotions. Okay, and the way the, the one way that we've looked at this is the upward spiral that um, exists between positive emotions, open awareness or broadened thinking, and that broadened thinking in turn inspires future positive emotions. So there's an upward spiral that's fueled by the fact that the causal arrow runs in both directions between uh, feeling positive emotions and their uh, mental um, components. Those mental components in turn cause future positive emotions. So when you look at dynamic data over time, you can see how these upward spirals take hold. And I described in an earlier lecture a, a really vital, oops, I don't need that. 
a really vital um, upward spiral that seems to go sort of through the heart and through the emotion of love. And I think this one in particular can help us understand why uh, experiences of love and social connection can be especially potent sources of growth. What we found is that people who have higher resting levels of what's called RSA, or respiratory sinus arrhythmia, this is a healthy form of heart rate variability, people who at rest or at baseline have higher levels of that than others, um, walk around the world each day uh, m m with more attunement to their opportunities to experience social connection with others. Okay, so when we've measured RSA in the laboratory and then tracked people's emotions and feelings of social connection in daily life, we find that we can predict how uh, responsive in terms of um, their positive emotion experiences to instances of social connection people are by knowing where they stand on this physiological metric. And then we find, importantly, that greater experiences of love and connection in daily life actually predict increases in uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia over the course of a month. Okay, so that there's this, um, not there, this is another example. We've, in our laboratory, we've um, come across a number of examples of upward spirals, but this is one that goes through the heart in two ways. <laughs> so it goes through the heart in terms of, in terms of um, changing literally the patterns and rhythms of, of uh, heart rate variability. This is the variability in heart rate that's associated with the breath. And also through the heart in terms of people's feelings of positive emotions with others, um, in connection with others. So just this, I, I have this in here just to remind us of the dynamics and the reciprocal causality and these upward spirals that are associated with positive emotions. That's a really critical uh, piece. Um, I also just want to remind you of this puzzle piece, that positive emotions open us, that, they, uh, that one aspect, one fundamental aspect of positive emotions is that when we're experiencing positive emotions, we, um, uh, it expands our view of the world, just like a, a, a flower opening up and um, you know, stretching itself open to catch all the light that it can. Positive emotions literally uh, change the scope of people's awareness. Okay, we've shown that in laboratory behavioral tests where people see the big picture. Other researchers have looked at that in terms of eye tracking. I think the most impressive research on this, the most definitive, is some brain imaging research that shows that basically people, when they're experiencing positive emotions, can't help but pick up information in their environment that they're actually told to ignore. <laughs> they're told, ignore this um, place around, but when people are experiencing positive emotions, they, they can't ignore it. They pick it up. They just absorb it automatically at a, at a perceptual level. That, that's some excellent work that comes out of Adam Anderson's lab in Toronto, if you're interested in uh, learning more about that. Uh, another aspect of, of positive emotions, again, that broader awareness that they're associated with also uh, predicts that when people are experiencing positive emotions, they're more likely to see their interdependence with others. They're more likely to recognize the common humanity they share with others. So there's a number of different ways that we have um, assessed this, this uh, way, this aspect of oneness that people experience in positive emotions. Uh, in, in an ordinary states, when people feel neutral or negative emotions, they're much more likely to think of themselves as separate from others. Okay, so uh, in different modes, people think of themselves more as separate. In other modes, in other uh, emotional experiences, particularly those associated with positive emotions, quite a number of positive emotions, not just love, um, amusement and contentment lead to the same sense of interconnection. Okay, and uh, another puzzle piece I just want to lay on, the, uh, on our uh, drafting board here is that, uh, remind you about my work that shows that 
finding ways to self-generate positive emotions. And the way that I've tested that is through looking at the effects of learning loving kindness meditation, um, changes who people are at a fundamental level. That positive, increasing your daily diet of positive emotions builds resources and, uh, and just puts people on a trajectory of growth that is measurable and that people notice in themselves the changes, but also that we're able to pick up these changes in terms of physiological differences that occur. So that is um, the way I sum up this other aspect of what positivity does to us that both opens our awareness and over time those moments of openness accumulate and compound and transform us for the better. Um, and this other core fact is that they transform us for the better. Um, in transforming us for the better, I've argued that positive emotions really help tip the scales from languishing in life to flourishing in life. Again, all living things can either languish barely holding on to life or flourish becoming the best version of yourself, making a contribution. And positivity seems to be uh, deeply connected to our ability to flourish. And, and uh, again, the ratio that I found that connects uh, positivity to the ability to flourish is experiencing three positive emotions for every negative emotion that you must endure. Three uh, positive emotions seems to um, counterweight, give you the proper levity to counterweight that gravity of negative emotions. So there's a particular ratio that appears to be a tipping point between languishing and flourishing. So these are all the uh, puzzle pieces I wanted to put on the table and then assemble them into a larger uh, program for understanding how it is that we can use this information to understand how people uh, can develop character, become the best versions of themselves, um, um, push along their own spiritual development. Sorry, this was another puzzle piece I wanted to add, was that pos positivity fuels resilience. And that was the subject of my last lecture, the, the fifth of the series. Um, there's one aspect of positive emotions that certainly um, my work has made a contribution, a cont particular contribution in showing how positive emotions open our awareness and transform us for the better and build. Now, the, a the, the aspect that positive emotions feel good, <laughs> that's been understood for a long time. That's the kind of like the basic definition of positive emotions is that they're good feelings. Um, and those good feelings are rewarding. Now, what, I'm, what I aim to do now is to weave this kind of just almost too obvious fact into the story more to, to point out how the rewarding aspects of positive emotions really are what drives um, transformation in people at a non-conscious level because we don't need to understand these rewards at a deliberate conscious level and say oh I want to um, grow and change in this direction so I'll, I'll um, willpower my way through it by setting up rewards. This, uh, these rewarding properties of positive emotions really work and unfold at a non-conscious level uh, and we know that through um, some contributions from behavioral neuroscience that I mentioned in the third lecture in more detail, but I just want to, again, put these puzzle pieces on the table so that we have them to work with here. And my interest in this was very much inspired by a, a serendipitous finding we had in our laboratory by looking at people in whom we had taught loving kindness meditation. We followed them up 15 months later and then um, uh, we were pleased to know that um, a number of people were still meditating, a good third of the sample one year later, and when we um, surprised them by coming back to them with a follow-up. Um, and the meditation was still having benefits. Um, that aside, what we learned is that people who eventually became those who continued meditation actually differed from their, their counterparts who discontinued right from the very first week. Okay, and this is the, the key difference is that people who continued meditating 
showed a faster, in, they didn't differ at baseline. So this isn't a story about um, how people who have more positive emotions just you know, do better overall. These people all kind of had the, about the same positive emotions before they started, but they had the biggest response to learning the meditation. And they were the ones who continued meditating. We have a, a figure very much like this, almost the exact same pattern that I, I don't have a slide of right now, but basically people who score uh, at baseline have higher respiratory sinus arrhythmia also show this faster rise in positive emotions for the loving kindness meditation. Okay, so there's, there's uh, ways that we're beginning to understand who is it that benefits the most from this practice. Um, here we see the, that benefiting quickly is associated with continuing med meditation. In this other work that's again is, is uh, a recent analysis of the same data, one of my graduate students, Bethany Cook, just sent me a graph that again looks very much like this except the high rising line is for people with high RSA, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, which is construed of as, uh, in, many, um, in many scientific circles, as a marker of flexible self-regulatory capacity. We're trying to argue that it also has something to do with the, the likelihood that people really absorb all they can from social opportunities in particular. <coughs> and so this loving kindness meditation is, is uh, a bit like a guided social opportunity that you do um, uh, over and over again. And it seems to yield some greater positive emotions with that. But I'm really interested in how it is that this early positive emotional reactivity seems to um, really ignite a, a lasting and sustained process of change in people. And this is what's gotten me interested in how positive emotions are connected to lifestyle change. And this builds very much on work that I mentioned earlier on liking versus wanting that, um, that derives from a colleague of mine, Kent Barrage's work with, with rats, actually. Um, he has decomposed what's rewarding about positive emotional states into looking at both um, how much an ac uh, a given experience is liked, um, and he's, he's using very simple experiences like sweet tastes, okay? And then separating that from how much it is wanted or how much uh, a rat will work to get that sweet taste, okay? So um, that often something is viewed as rewarding simply because rats will work to experience it again, press a bar, okay, in a Skinner box. Um, and it was sort of thought reward was all of a piece, that it, if something is enjoyable, then it's, uh, it serves as a reward. What he, and that is generally the case um, because wanting and liking are in, in a healthy functioning human and a healthy functioning rat and other mammals are completely confounded. Where there is liking, there will be wanting afterwards. There are some cases where they diverge. And in those cases when they diverge, um, uh, through experimentally creating those divergent cases, like the example that's, that's been built on a lot in this work is drug addictions, um, uh, has allowed Kent Barrage to discover that there are completely separate brain systems supporting liking and wanting. That, uh, uh, the wanting, the, the willingness to um, spend energy to re-experience something is, dop is dopamine-based, whereas the liking is opioid-based. Okay, um, and addiction is one way to think of it as wanting gone bad, wanting run, run amok, um, that even when the, the drugs of abuse are no longer providing pleasure, uh, addicts are intensely motivated to um, re-experience their drug of choice or their drug of abuse, even if it goes against their wishes. You know, they're, they're, they're in recovery, they don't want to use anymore, but it's like the cravings are uncontrollable, which help us under, understand that this is very much happening at a, at a um, physiological, non-conscious level that 
um, wanting sometimes happens, at, or sometimes we experience wanting as a really explicit conscious um, uh, phenomena, and other times it's just that um, the things that we eventually will pursue behaviorally are sparkle, they kind of sparkle and grab our attention and draw us in at a non-conscious level. So what I'd like to argue is that sitting between liking and wanting is this other state called non-conscious incentive salience. And this is, um, well, this again, this is a phrase that draws from Kent Barrage's work, but it's basically that the people and objects associated with pleasurable, liked experiences uh, through experiential learning come to, uh, in a way, sparkle with incentive salience that draws us in. Okay. Uh, in my lab, we kind of jokingly inf and informally call this glitter dust. Okay, so that you don't have to. Um, as a great example of this, I, I remember seeing my my um, older son Garrett <coughs> see his best friend ride his bike about a block away, and uh, he's just like, "Oh, gotta go!" You know, just the vision of his friend. It wasn't like he was having fun watching his friend drive by on a bike, but seeing his friend. Uh, lifted his heart in a way and drew him to go get his own bike and go be with his friend. Okay, so that wasn't a moment of, of liking. He wasn't yet enjoying the good time that he would have with his friend, but all the past good times that he'd had with his best friend made the image of his friend just light him up and draw him out. He didn't have to think, I, oh, there he goes. Should I play now? You know, it wasn't a deliberate sense. It was a way in which those activities that in the past have been associated with uh, pleasurable experiences at a non-conscious level draw us towards them to re-experience them. This is a way that um, positive growth <coughs> does not have to rely on deliberate schooling or deliberate intention. It's the way our minds and bodies are designed that things that were experienced as uh, pleasurable in the past change the way we look at the environment so that um, people and behavioral cues that can lead us to good outcomes in the future start to call us <laughs> at a non-conscious level. Okay. Um, now, that can, be, that can go awry. Materialism, uh, drugs of addiction, all those other things also kind of sparkle with that pleasure and draw us towards them. So this is true of both pleasures and positive emotions. And I, I think the distinction between pleasures and positive emotions lies in that <coughs> pleasures, in a way, like negative emotions, are about the here and now. They satisfy a particular biological need for food, warmth, hunger, you could view sex in this way, perhaps. Whereas positive emotions are not just about the here and now. They also have this, through the broadening and building, they also uh, change our futures for the better. And so in this model that I'm developing, there's a really sharp difference between pleasure and positive emotions that um, very few other theorists have, are making. They just kind of look at it all as positive experiences. Okay, so I think there's, when we want to look at how um, people change and grow for the better, instead of just getting hooked on something, <laughs> we need to understand this difference between pleasures and positive emotions. So, um, all right, so here's the slide that's uh, the best images I could find for this glitter dust idea. Unfortunately, they look a little more like pleasures than positive emotions, the convertible car and the, uh, the woman's face. Okay, liking and wanting. I Just to summarize what I've been saying about liking and wanting, that when people um, experience a new behavior, sometimes that will lead to liking that new behavior. Not always. Some behaviors aren't necessarily liked, and that liking can be redescribed as positive affect. That positive affect might be either emotions or pleasure. 
And those are two different classes of positive affect. I'm using positive affect as a term that is an umbrella term that covers both pleasures and positive emotions. That pleasures and positive emotions, through associative learning, uh, change the way we perceive objects in the environment and imbue them with incentive salience or make them sparkle or have an allure that just draws us in. Um, this is how positive attitudes are formed at a non-conscious level. And that, that uh, those positive attitudes at a non-conscious level then motivate behavioral wanting or the motive to repeat or the willingness to do work or to, to arrange your day so that you can see this best friend or arrange your day so that you can go on a run through the woods at noon, um, even on a work day. Um, or, uh, and that is what lets, leads people to engage in that behavior again. Okay. Again, that's, uh, this is not a willpower way of getting into uh, behavioral maintenance, but a non-conscious motivation way. Okay, so um, just another puzzle piece to put on the table. I want to remind you of the work that I mentioned, um, uh, I think in lecture three, that Robert Valorant has done on passion for life activities. These could be passions like uh, people who are passionate about running, people who are passionate about being in nature or, or making art, people who are passionate about collecting stamps. He studied all of these. You could be passionate about spiritual pursuits as well. Um, what he's pointed out, he has a dualistic model of passion that points out that passions come in basically two forms, harmonious and obsessive. Both of these have in common that the passions are pleasurable and wanted. So they both have liking and wanting as part of them. But after that, harmonious and obsessive passions um, diverge. Whereas uh, he's shown empirically that harmonious passions are more likely to be associated with the experience of positive emotions during um, them, whereas negative, uh, uh, obsessive passions are more likely to be associated with negative emotions, even when you're engaging in them, and especially if you're prevented from engaging with them. And then there's also differences in the flexibility um, and whether they seem to be in balance with the rest of life healthy and unhealthy. I guess the way to think about this is people are really obsessively passionate about a given activity. They sometimes engage in that activity even if, even at risk to their own physical health um, uh, or uh, at risk to their um, relationships. They may um, be so obsessive about their sport or their hobby that you know, other, th other aspects of life kind of um, uh, are never as important. Harmonious passions are passions that are pursued in those ways but seem to be in harmony with the rest of life. So this is a figure that I shared with you in Lecture 3. And this is a, a model, but I'm going to later shrink it and make it just a piece of a larger model. <laughs> so I want to walk through it again just so you have this piece in mind, and then you can see it in a, in a broader context still. But that is that um, new positive behaviors often lead to uh, or can lead to increased positive emotions. Again, not all new positive behaviors will, but if they do, this model um, uh, is one that I would propose uh, is followed. And normally you could say that increased positive emotions would lead to the development of this har harmonious passion for new behavior. Now, my interest is not in just seeing that direct effect between positive emotions and the development of harmonious passions, but I want to kind of see how, what are the mechanisms through which experiences of positive emotions might lead to harmonious passion for a new behavior? Again, the, the model that I'm interested in testing this against, because this is where I have data already, is with meditation. So um, if, if meditation yields positive emotions, which it especially does when you're working with a, a, a meditation like loving kindness meditation, then these effects should take hold. And the next series of studies that I'm planning will compare a uh, loving kindness meditation to a different kind of meditation that will, uh, mindfulness meditation, that will have fewer positive emotions in it. And so it's a, uh, a way to see, well, here they're learning a new behavior, but it has less positive emotion in it. And so maybe there'll be less of this model that I'm going to describe to you uh, next unfolding. So what I'm arguing is that building on that past work, that 
that one way, because positive emotions are pleasurable, that, po that there's a pleasurable, feel-good part of positive emotions, it, and it, and it um, triggers or builds this non-conscious incentive salience for the objects and people associated with that behavior. So there's that, that um, non-conscious hook that gets people uh, passionate about an activity. But that could get people obsessively passionate about it as just as likely as harmoniously passionate. I think to get to har harmonious passion, you also need to have these broaden and build pathways that I've um, mentioned in a lot of the other studies where increased positive emotions not only have that likable hook that c puts uh, out this glitter dust that, that attracts us to that activity again, but it also builds resources, especially things like uh, flexible self-regulatory capacity Okay, our ability to be more flexible and balance all the different aspects of our lives. And that's what would, would distinguish between um, new positive behaviors that, in, um, that increase pleasures only and not positive emotions wouldn't have this lower broaden and build path. Okay, so there's the, the um, non-conscious uh, incentive salience, that liking wanting path on the upper route, but the broaden and build path would only be there for positive emotions like love, contentment, serenity, and not so much with just plain pleasure. Um, so, but those positive emotions have both routes happening in tandem, and so you get not only hooked by the activity, but you're also developing skills and abilities that allow you to pursue that activity with flexibility and balance. Okay, so uh, one reason I have these little pictures here, the heart man and the glitter dust and the, the RSA as an example of one example of one of many resources that are built with positive emotions, because in the next slide I want to take this piece and shrink it and just have the pictures stand in for what you saw, because there's just no way to put all this on the one slide <laughs> if I didn't do that. So, oh, I forgot. There are also, this is, uh, these next two arrows are what make this uh, an upward spiral, is that this non-conscious incentive salience gets you going back to repeat that behavior, that these increased resources, this is a version of the upward spiral that I showed you earlier between um, respiratory sinus arrhythmia and the increased positive emotions. People who are higher on that seem to get more positive emotion out of their daily experiences. So there's ways in which this model is carrying forward and getting tighter and stronger all the time, every time people come through this, these recursive loops. Okay, so it's those feedback loops that help make it an upward spiral model, but it's kind of like two spirals going at once. Okay, so now is the time to shrink this part and just have the heart man, the <laughs> glitter dust, and the RSA stand in for that. So what I just showed you on the last slide is now shrunk into this piece. Um, that uh, new behaviors, new spiritual practices, new lifestyle habits can create uh, self-reported or self-under, you know, um, awareness that you have a, a passion for this activity that is harmonious. And, and Robert Valorant has um, a very simple self-report measure that's used to um, that you can use with any activity that people, any life activity that they spend a lot of time with, and you can get from that a score for how, how much harmonious passion do you have for that activity and how much obsessive passion do you have for that activity. And it's not a typology. It's not that um, some people are 100% harmonious and some are not. You can get a factor score on each of those for any individual and any activity. So it's very... Um, uh, amenable to research. And then I want to argue that um, harmonious passion is in a in a very important way an immediate precursor of sustained behavior. Okay, that uh, we have a huge problem in this country about behavior change. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a major issue underlying um, the obesity epidemic and other aspects of people know what they should do to be healthier people. Everybody knows the information about physical activity and diet, but it doesn't affect our day-to-day -day behaviors. And that, I think, is because we're assuming 
that knowledge of how to behave is sufficient for behavioral change. Okay, so I think we've learned um, through the experience of public health campaigns that knowledge is not enough, that we need to understand how, these, how behavior change happens at a non-conscious level. And so this is uh, the, one of the uh, motivations for me to understand how positive emotions are related to sustained behavior change because sustained behavior change is a huge health problem in um, uh, not just around physical health, also can be about um, addictions and gambling addictions and other things so that when people try to make changes in their life they find that it's not so easy and that's in part because past experiences have have created non-conscious tracks to repeat the unhealthy behavior that they've um, gotten so uh, behaviorally dependent on. Okay, and so it's only with sustained behavior that you can truly have a lifestyle change or uh, character development or spiritual development or flourishing mental health. Um, otherwise, you just have a, a fun experience one day, <laughs> you know. Um, if you really want to make that into something that changes who people are, puts them on a trajectory of growth and a trajectory of flourishing, uh, help, uh, physically healthier, both at, um, uh, in terms of um, being more physically active or eating more fruits and vegetables or um, managing uh, stress in more healthy ways. Those are all things that are going to impact physical health that all of those things depend on getting to this stage of sustained behavior. Okay, so um, this is the broader model that is forming the base for my uh, current planned work and I think it also can help us understand this um, broader issue is how to, in a sustained way, become the best versions of ourselves, become uh, more moral, more noble, more loving, more uh, connected to the world, more able to uh, make a positive difference. I think the same, uh, we, we need to find a way to enable uh, people to see that their positive emotion experiences are part of what leads to those paths of change. <coughs> So this is the, the slide I used earlier to, to suggest that um, we can often let our positive emotions or the physiology involved with our positive emotions, that, uh, that dopaminergic surge that goes with wanting, that, that um, incentive salience glitter dust, all of that stuff is happening at a uh, neurobiological level that helps um, connect us to sustained behavior changes that allow us to change who we are and how we are in the world and help us become our best versions of ourselves, that we don't necessarily have to have a plan of lifestyle change, a plan of spiritual development, a plan of character growth. What we need to do is pay more attention to momentary experiences of positive emotions and know that those momentary experiences of love, of other positive emotions, are actually lighting the way to uh, positive uh, lifestyle changes. And that, uh, again, attending to the moment, attending to the physiological experiences of positive emotions in, in loving kindness meditation, that could be attending to how it makes your body feel, how it makes your heart feel. Those are not just um, momentary cues, they are uh, the, um, we, we tend to think of positive emotions as some sort of extra, some sort of uh, bonus, like, oh, if I go through my daily life and then I, ha I feel good, that's just kind of an added, you know, icing on the cake, you know, and this is arguing that, no, that's the, that's the nourishment, right? There is the nourishment that helps us grow in this positive direction. It's not icing on the cake. It is the fruits and vegetables. <laughs> I don't want to say it's the cake. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, I think too, kind of drawing in the work that I mentioned earlier today about uh, the dialectics of positive and negative, that this isn't so much, I just wanted to underscore that this isn't about 
um, only paying attention to positive emotions, that uh, paying attention to the broader picture and recognizing suffering that goes on in the world can actually fuel this growth better, kind of give the positive emotions more traction. You know, I think of that um, traction as being a really nice metaphor because I think sometimes if you have too much positivity without being grounded in sort of the reality of suffering in the world or, or recognition of one's own pain and negative emotions, that we can kind of just spin our wheels and go nowhere. You know, that, that our positive emotions are ungrounded and therefore we don't really have traction to move forward. Okay, so I think that awareness of difficulty, awareness of suffering is um, an important container in which to self-generate positive emotions, self-generate uh, moments of love. And it is a way in which these two work together to give momentum towards um, growth. So again, um, I've shown you this slide a couple of times. I'd like to just um, point out again that the science of emotions has uh, revealed to us that there are um, very important um, mechanisms of sort of fight or flight that really have to do with self-survival. And so much of psychology has been on this side of understanding emotions and stress <laughs> and how that affects the body. And we're just beginning to understand at a physiological level how um, positive emotions, how other focus, how experiences of love are also deeply writ written into our biology and have a system of their own that can help us grow and change in, in a positive direction. And that's um, part of the, the roadmap or the blueprint that I'm trying to spell out is how, um, again, this isn't the case. Some people, uh, it's very common in psychology to make things into a typology or a personality trait and say that, oh, you know, some people are all selfish and others are all giving. Or um, uh, the initial version of um, Shelley Taylor's tend and befriend hypothesis was that while well, men do fight or flight and women do tend or befriend, um, she's backed off on that. Um, and I think that not even, it's not even helpful to be thinking of these as person variables. They're moment variables. We all have moments in which we are in self-survival mode, fight or flight, and we all have moments when we're in uh, species survival mode. And those, we go in and out of those moments. We can foster those moments more. And we need to really understand this at a dynamic level. Um, I want to just briefly touch on some other research that I've done with a current graduate student of mine, Lana Catalino, where we've looked at how people's attitudes about positive experience are also vitally important. That in addition to, um, okay, so positive, positivity itself is, is a momentary experience. And yet um, people through learning and psychoeducation can come to value positive emotion experiences to a greater degree. And when they do, it makes a big difference. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, write my book, Positivity, and get this, this uh, awareness out to uh, broader circles than just scientists, because I think it makes a difference in how you organize your day. It makes a difference in how you um, uh, decide what's a, what's a valuable thing to do this day, this week, this year. It helps us set our priorities differently. And that has been an interest of um, my student, um, Lana Catalino. She has developed a measure that we call positive valuation, or PV for short, that has a subscale for, that basically has items like, um, you know, when, when I think about, uh, when I pick my activities for the day, I try to think about what's gonna make me f come alive with joy. Um, or I admire people who experience positive emotions a lot. But we found is the real traction is with when you have items that really have to do with today, making a choice for now. Am I, am I privileging or valuing or elevating the importance of ex the experience of positive emotions? And people vary on that. So we have a subscale that measures how much people value 
positive emotions. We also have two other scales in there that I think are very important to control for. Is also how much people value emotions in general, negative emotions too. But also, um, we wanted to be able to distinguish it between people who just think it's important to uh, exude positivity to others, <laughs> as opposed to actually experiencing them themselves. Um, sort of that Pollyanna version of like, I just need to be happy. It's important that people think I'm happy even if I'm not. Okay, so there's, that's a personality uh, style in itself that I think is actually um, quite unhelpful. So we wanted to be able to control for that to see people who value positive emotions but not just the exterior uh, projection of positive emotions. Okay, and what, basically what we found across a number of studies is that people have um, and this is what we're, she's continuing to test in her dissertation, which is just now unfolding, is the, the hypothesis is that people who score higher on positive valuation um, experience more of these broaden and build effects of positive emotions. So it's a way to kind of put yourself in, through maybe psychoeducation, in the group that uh, has a bigger uh, positive emotion yield from things like loving kindness, uh, meditation practice or even you know if you see a funny movie or can, can connect with someone you actually get more positive emotion out of everyday experiences if you go into it with the attitude that positive emotions matter because instead of thinking oh, this is trivial let's move on and achieve something here um, you actually might attend to it differently try to trump up that feeling and in doing so the benefits are greater of the positive emotion experience. So um, one reason uh, why, you know, I was talking in the break with other people who teach positive psychology, and people say, um, students will often say, this totally changed my view of the world. I don't have to wait till I'm 30 and I've achieved all these things to be happy. I could be happy now. <laughs> that, that idea, that, that just mental shift, that, and, and if I'm happy now, it matters. And that's the key that I think is missing a lot of times, is that people, people think, oh, happy would be fine, but really what I need to do is, is build my resume. Um, so uh, this uh, positive psychology suggests that people actually will be more successful, but I think um, the more important lesson is that you know, there's ways in which it opens our minds, builds our, uh, builds our uh, resources for the better, and we actually benefit from it more if we go into daily life experience expecting that positive emotions matter. Uh, okay, I want to just end by um, doing a little bit on the practical uh, how-to side, um, just to offer a few very quick cautionary notes. Um, so positive emotions may be really vital to our abilities to change and become uh, uh, our best versions of ourselves. In that, um, you know, this is the kind of positive psychology advice that comes out a lot, and this is my advice: is that um, actually taking the motto "be positive" is is really dangerous because it leads to feigned uh, that exterior um, presentation of positive emotions that is not heartfelt, that is not genuine and sincere. And I think it's uh, those exterior versions of positive emotions, the yellow smiley faces, don't lead us in the right direction. There's some really uh, heart-wrenching work to show that it actually um, is uh, physiologically toxic and interpersonally very costly. So feigned positivity, I think, is um, quite toxic. You can't quite see in this picture, but she's got a tear running down, so she's got kind of both, both going at the same time. But the, um, uh, I, can, I don't have time to go into that work too um, much, but I just wanted to have this a quick caution that um, uh, positive emotions, if they're not heartfelt, aren't necessarily doing this transformative work that we're talking about. And yet there's a, there's a Sufi proverb that I really like that, that helps us make sense of all those yellow smiley faces that we see around us, is that there wouldn't be such a thing as counterfeit gold if there were no real gold somewhere. So the real gold are those sincere experiences of positive emotions that are really heartfelt and, and moving. Um, Loving kindness meditation seems to be one way to um, promote those more sincere positive emotions. Um, and again, the emphasis in this practice is not to force oneself to feel these ways, but to understand that these feelings are 
are desirable or that they can matter a lot in people's lives and to create a longing to experience those emotions and then to see what follows from that. Um, but another uh, meditation is not for everybody. I think another route into experiencing greater sincere positive emotions is to lightly create the mindset of positivity. Meditation does this, but there are other ways in daily life just to do that, and that is to kind of be open, be appreciative, be curious, be kind, um, be real. Um, those again, those are ways of describing the mindset of positivity that we've learned through research as part of this upward spiral dynamic. We can dip into that mindset to uh, unleash more positive emotions. I want to, um, uh, this is just reminding you that sincerity is uh, the, the key here. Um, I want to just close by touching back on some of those uh, uh, per takes on spirituality that might help frame some of this work um, and help us understand how to take this blueprint for lifestyle change, character development, and see it also as a way of understanding uh, spiritual development. Um, William James, uh, in the variety of religious experiences, really uh, uh, emphasized in particular that religion can be viewed as feelings, acts, and experiences. Again, um, this helps lay the groundwork for why a scientific investigation of emotions can also be a scientific investigation of spiritual development. Um, Karen Armstrong uh, described religion as an as a altered state of consciousness or different mode of consciousness. And again, that, that again casts um, everything we know about emotions, especially positive emotions, and, and uh, ecstasy, or ecstatic experiences are ones that uh, she in particular writes about as being quite relevant to how people un have understood from ancient times onward uh, the role of of religion in people's lives. Um, Sharon Salzberg um, has written about how faith is this, from the Buddhist perspective, is the view of, of to place one's heart upon. But, and she, she has a beautiful book that describes faith as, as trusting one's own deepest experiences. So not faith in a creed or faith in uh, other sets of ideas, but faith in One's own, one's own experiences and using that as a, as a guide to understand what's the right thing for me to do in this situation? Well, let me really look at how I feel and have faith in that. Okay, that's a, um, uh, again, a very uh, Buddhist perspective is that don't listen to any people giving you advice. See, check in with your own experiences and see if it, if it rings true there, then uh, it's, it's a good uh, way to decide between various ways of acting, which is the right way to act. Uh, I just wanted to remind you of this um, quote here again. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh has described both the Holy Spirit in, in making connections between Christianity and Buddhism. He he's comes to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit is mindful awareness and its fruits, that it's love, compassion, and joy. The fruits are love, compassion, and joy, and those two together are how he understands uh, the notion of Holy Spirit in Christianity. Um, my good friend and colleague George Valiant has done a lot of work with emotions and adult development, and he has um, uh, a nice way of saying that spirituality is positive emotions, and he has a beautiful book called Spiritual Evolution that draws a lot on the broaden and build theory that, that um, I've mentioned before to talk about how positive emotions are a source of uh, spiritual development. He has a beautiful quote in there that says, the, the shortest definition of spirituality that I know is love. And I guess that from the work that I've done that shows that love maybe is a leading way in which po uh, uh, positive emotions seem to have their biggest effects in people, I think that he very well may be right there. I want to add in uh, a a uh, quote from a book that my husband encouraged me to read when I was um, developing these lectures, um, the latest book by John Shelby Spong. He, um, it's completely consistent with these ideas of broaden and build that suggest that 
you know, God is present when a person sees unity and not separation. So this is an example of when, when people have this unity consciousness or the sense that we're, we're connected, that that is an example of a spiritual experience that um, uh, can drive us forward. And I would think that that, um, since positive emotions allow us to see our common humanity with others and allow us to see our fundamental interdependence, there's a way in which you can understand this also from a scientific angle that when people are able to um, see their interconnection more, that that is um, a source of um, positive emotions and, and uh, lights the path towards getting a better understanding of God or, or a spiritual presence. Um, oh, I had in my uh, notes another um, quote by him, but I don't have it memorized and I didn't put it on a slide. So, or maybe I did on the next slide. Ah, yes, I did. Um, he uh, relatedly talks about the more deeply I am able to love, the more God becomes part of me. So he's very much uh, moving from a, a view of Christianity that puts God up in the sky and out there to God as being within individuals, but not necessarily just residing somewhere in individuals, but in experiences of love. When, what I like about this is that it points out about how those distributed positive emotions, um, it, this may just be a way of describing the same phenomena that we've been describing from a scientific angle, that um, those moments of positive emotions and love that we feel with others that allow us to have this interconnection are not just interesting human experiences, that those are the ones that lead us to, to um, step up to the highest level of humanity and morality, that allow us to grow and change and become better instances of human, become our best versions of ourselves, become higher, uh, expand into our highest capabilities of, um, of uh, more, more and more uh, godlike. Now that is a way that um, I'm borrowing here a little bit from my colleague in the field, John Height's work, where he argues that um, disgust is the negative emotion that we feel when we see people behaving in their mo more, most base ways, most animal-like, or ways that in which we uh, disapprove of them. And elevation is the positive emotion that we feel when we see others um, uh, be behave more godlike or more in a uh, high, uh, conforming to a higher moral code. Okay, so love could be the experience that we're feeling when we are uh, behaving at, 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 the, at our highest moral code. So that might make other people feel elevation, but the personal experience of that could be one in which we're feeling very big hearted and very connected to others. Okay, so um, I just thought that was an interesting connection to make, but also. I just wanted to point out that that's also very much in the popular versions of um, Eastern approaches to religion and spirituality. Um, and uh, I put in a Deepak Chopra quote, because um, that every person is a god in embryo, its only desire is to be born. Um, that, again, idea here is that, um, again, experiences of love could help us get to that more morally elevated, godlike state, um, and that when we recognize that higher level in others, that is a source of positive emotion and love, but also that experience of positive emotions and love help us get there. So I just want to point out that it may be no coincidence that these perspectives on um, uh, universal consciousness um, and experiencing God as love and love as God, that, that those connections may not be arbitrary. Those may be very much deeply built into our biology through um, uh, uh, human um, uh, evolution. And one of the things that um, I think about, uh, this is the gesture I always use in my lab for broadening, so that, that um, uh, our, our minds just open up with positive emotions. And we also, I, perhaps it's no coincidence that, 
you know, in, in opening our awareness, we're able to see the big picture more. We're able to see the system in which our problems exist. We're able to see our interdependence with others. We're able to see uh, the broader picture. You could say it gives you more of a God's eye view of the world. Um, and that uh, standing back and being able to see that interdependence is uh, perhaps what will allow us to solve the bigger problems on this earth uh, that seem to continually uh, vex us. Seeing that, getting a little bit more of that God's eye view, seeing the big picture, seeing the system, uh, it may be exactly what we need. Um, I want to thank you for your kind attention, not just in this lecture, but all through today and all through last month. Um, you've been a great audience, and I really appreciate it. I'd be happy to take any questions. So we have a microphone on each side of the room. If you'd like to ask a question, please come up. OK, first. Um, this has been wonderful, this, this series of lectures. Thank you. And I am thinking a lot about your research in meditation. Uh -huh. You referred a lot to the loving kindness. And I um, am just sitting here thinking about the power you have in terms of your lab and the amount of subs you can get and how much influence you can have on the research in the area of meditation where there's not a lot of empirical scientific data, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was just wondering if you had considered other types of meditation also to consider in addition to loving kindness. And this right. is what I'm thinking. Loving kindness clearly is a way where you can um, develop positive motion pretty immediately in uh -huh. the practice. Uh -huh. um, mindfulness meditation, it's a much quieter type of positive emotion. It's a mm -hmm. positive presence of unconditional you know, non-judgment, acceptance. Right. And instead of focusing on the positive emotion of love, you allow anything to show up. And then you can help sort of dissolve, learn how to dissolve that negativity right. when it shows exactly. up. And I'm thinking of your un, undoing hypothesis, right. your undoing. Right. So I'm wondering in your research, it just, I guess it's more of encouragement to think about how could you study the positive emotional impact on dissolving the negative from the different yes. types of meditation practice? Yes. That's exactly one of my main interests in, in, in um, I'm setting up a study that will compare loving kindness and mindfulness and I've featured just what I think are the um, mechanisms of action behind how loving kindness works. But I haven't highlighted my um, secret hunches about how mindfulness works. Yeah, yeah. And um, here's where the ratio of positive to negative emotions, I think, uh, matters. I think um, you m what we might discover, and this is a, a hypothesis I have going in, is that mindfulness meditation is especially useful for people whose positivity ratio is low in part because they have a, an excessive amount of negativity. I agree. That um, that, that decentered thinking would allow people to stop getting on the runaway train of negative thoughts leading to negative emotions. And that, but there's other ways to have a low positivity ratio. You could have fairly low negative emotions, but also very low positive emotions. And for that kind of uh, person, um, loving kindness meditation might be a good first practice. It kind of might depend on what's people's, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, tapestry of emotions in people's lives. You know, what is um, certain, certain types of pre meditation practice may be best fitting for uh, either different um, emotion disorders or just emotion tendencies. So I do think that um, that one of the, the pieces of advice I give about how to um, spark genuine positive emotions is the, f the first one, uh, I think the motto, be open, is far more effective than the model, motto, um, be positive. And the reason that works is the same way I yeah, think yes. mindfulness yes. Yeah. works. Mindfulness of the present moment will allow people to see that um, uh, you know, so often we're absorbed, we, we're full of expectations for how a situation should be, or we're, you know, involved in mental time travel, ruminating about yeah. the past, worrying about the future, that we just miss the sources of goodness that are right yeah. here present, yeah. you know, always present, you know, human kindness, connection, natural beauty, all kinds of things that are very subtle and easy to miss, and they seem not as important as that worry I have about the future, that rumination about the past. But if you're really open to the present moment, which is what mindfulness can teach, right. uh, then positive emotions can actually come flooding in. 
So I think that's, um, that's a very different approach to increasing positive emotions. Um, and I, my statistician uh, really wants me to have a third condition, <laughs> that is a no meditation control, or you know, just a control group who just measures things, because she's like, well, the, the differences between mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation may be so subtle that we're not able to really pick them up statistically. But um, uh, there's a, a, a critique of most meditation research is that very, most of it has been deemed low quality science. And that's because the control conditions aren't very rigorous. They don't allow us to really separate out placebo and just um, uh, non-specific aspects of being part of a group. And so that's what this more rigorous uh, comparison will do. But if um, uh, my, my hunch is that the positive emotional benefits of mindfulness meditation will be slower to accumulate, that it will take more practice in be becoming good at mindfulness before it really yeah. ripens yeah. and yields that positive emotion. And I think, I think um, uh, the, the experimental design kind of hinges on the fact that maybe loving kindness will get you there faster. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, but I would kind of make one more, just a suggestion as I'm thinking. I'm thinking you have this lab and access to a huge data pool. Why not a fourth condition where you have a mix of yeah. mindfulness and yeah. um, loving kindness? I think that'll be the next grant after this. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks again. A uh, wonderful set of lectures. And I wanted to offer a response and then a question. The response comes just from perspective of a philosopher who okay. tries to theorize about religion but is hoping to learn as much as possible from the mind-brain sciences. And one of the things that I really, really liked about these lectures is that you focused on emotions, positive emotions and their importance to spirituality in a way that didn't lose sight of the cognitive side. Mm -hmm. That's how I would put it, uh, of positive emotions in a way that uh, what little I had read before this uh, in positive psychology about spirituality seems sometimes to do, and that is to just almost talk as if spirituality is, is about the cultivation of warm and fuzzy feelings, right. whereas from the very beginning your talk has given really, uh, I think, fascinating data about how positive emotions help people to pick up a peripheral information, right. Right. make them much more receptive. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, if you define cognition rather broadly, in a sense, I right. mean, positive emotions are cognitive skills. They're ways of yes. relating uh, to the environment. And, and right. attunement is a wonderful way to sort of uh, pick that up in a way that doesn't, uh -huh. you know, conflate this emotional cognitive ability right. with other kinds. Right. And just in contrast a lot of the the most prominent cognitive science approaches to religion are very focused on cognition without paying attention to emotion but in a way that's extraordinarily narrow i mean interprets the cognitive side of of religiosity primarily in terms of propositions about supernatural beings and then tries to understand religion in that way cognitively uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so I'm just saying this is this is a wonderful addition, and I hope it gets picked up by psychologists of right. religion. Right. Um, my my question along that vein is just when it came time to offer, you know, a, a definition of spirituality, um, you 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 mentioned some examples where they say you know maybe positive emotions really just are spirituality, yeah. but in but given the previous. Uh, all, all that we had learned about the importance of it being three to one and not three to zero right. and how 11 to one is, is maybe a, a kind of religious or spiritual pathology. Right, right. Uh, th there, there's, there's an opening for a really nuanced right. description right. of spirituality as emotional attunement yeah, that like is that. actually really receptive to, to bad stuff as well yeah. as the good stuff. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. Um, uh, and that would be, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that is exactly what the full fabric of what I've presented is pointing to, and I just didn't see it. Thank you. That'll be a, a nice way to feature that. Um, and again, find a way to um, have a, uh, a way of looking at this beyond George Valiant's view of spirituality as love, which I think is really important. But it's, this is why I had the equanimity slide. It's love with awareness of suffering. So maybe it's that emotional tapestry driven by love, but not love exclusively. I really like that. 
Um, and I'll, with your permission, I'll use it. <laughs> um, the, I just want to make a comment about the um, kind of separation of cognition and emotion. Uh, the field of psychology as a whole really um, uh, started, well, there was, uh, you know, kind of Freud and psychoanalytic approaches that got quickly ushered out by behaviorism, which was the only thing that matters is behavior. And then in the 1960s, we had the cognitive revolution, and mental states were allowed back in to psychology. Emotional states were not allowed back in. They were considered far too fluffy, too uh, not appropriate for rigorous science. Uh, but cognitive states made it in the door. And that, I think, unfortunately reified this distinction between cognition and emotion that a more sophisticated science of emotions in the last 20 years has just thrown out the window. It's like you can't separate out feeling from thinking. They are so intertwined at every level. It's, um, there was an old debate between um, Richard Lazarus and Bob Zients that was, you know, which comes first, thinking or feeling? And, you know, it's like one of those debates that just, you know, they're just talking past each other <laughs> because Emotional states fundamentally um, hinge on uh, interpretations of the world, um, and yet those interpretations of the world are often fueled by rudimentary emotional states, so they're just tightly woven all the way through. There's no way to separate them. And um, so I think when other fields um, come in and try to dip into their understanding of psychology, they often go back to that earlier stage where they really think of cognition and emotion as separate. And, and um, because that's uh, just a, a framework that had gotten a lot of airplay and a lot of, a lot of journal pages. <laughs> so, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that that can um, be uh, worn away as we get into this more, much more nuanced way of, of looking at emotions. So that's a, that's a, um, it's an observation that definitely describes the whole field of psychology, and hopefully we're moving beyond that, too. So. I want to thank you. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say something about what a couple of things that have happened to my thinking uh -huh. in the course of these six talks. Um, I have had a background of some of the tougher kind of Catholic, uh, being, you know, being raised Catholic in Boston, Irish uh, sort of stuff. Um, and I, I can remember being six years old and going, thinking for a whole weekend about whether I could be a saint. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I actually decided at the end of the weekend that I could, and I went in to see Sister Mary Gervais and told her that I decided that I could be a saint, mm -hmm. but that it would be boring, I didn't want to. Um, I didn't get on too well with them, you might imagine. Um, but I, I think the first positive thing is that obviously being a saint can be positive and fun and pleasurable. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean from the bottom of my heart, being able to look at it that way is really, you know, I suppose it's been coming to me, but it came to me more out of psychology than kind of being able to uh -huh. <clears throat> make a peace between the two things. Right. And the second point is, I'm less clear about it, but uh, <clears throat> it's a point of view from which I will become more clear, <clears throat> which is that I think that the way you deal with positive emotions, and especially the ratio, mm -hmm. um, absolutely requires and keeps us anchored to reality. Right. <clears throat> and for that matter, I think honestly to a real world. It's not a monastery. <clears throat> um, it, <clears throat> it's a world in which people do things and they do things with people. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and, and that's the kind of toughest, fullest one of them. And I think that in the work that you're doing, there, there are the seeds not only of a, a sort of a neurobiological connection to reality that uh -huh. has to be, uh -huh. um, but in a whole bunch of other ways, and, and perhaps the, the beginning for me is, is best put in, the, in your positivity ratio where <clears throat> the, the bottom of it is, 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 is being yeah. connected to the negative. Mm -hmm. And in a kind of way, because I think that in a whole lot of ways in psychology, in, in our society, I think positive affect is the low price spread. 
<clears throat> is the, the low price spread. It's the oleomargarine. It's, uh, yeah. <clears throat> it has, uh, positive psychology has only in the last 10 years had any status. And people who were doing that before then were really fighting an uphill, low status battle. Right. <clears throat> uh, you know, people like Ed DC and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And they, they qualify as saints, say, right. In, right. In, in that sort of way. So that I, I think it's really interesting and important to get the connection with reality right. Um, right. In, in there. And it's, it's subtle, but I mean, I sort of see it as almost like sewing something. There's a pattern and, uh -huh. and uh -huh. where reality fits in is sort of there. Right. And again, I think it's that, um, that connection to reality that allows, again, traction to take off that's right. and, to, <clears throat> and to actually go somewhere. That, that, that's right. I mean, actually, it's the facilitating that, that reality may be difficult, but it also is and can be facilitating. And it's and where anyway, we live. And anyway, <laughs> uh, you, can't, yeah. you, know, you can't avoid it. It's there. Right. Exactly. And so I think this more grounded view, if you look at it that way, could, um, uh, again, be that both and way. I really need to keep working in, and this is for reminding me at the end that I hadn't quite kept it at the both and level, um, help us see those things as not in opposition. That the, that the awareness of suffering helps us love better <laughs> yeah, and helps us love in a realistic way and helps us love in a way that's going to change us for the better. That having that awareness of our own suffering and awareness of other suffering is really vital to that. Um, so. And the, the last thing simply is it was really terrific in the last half hour that you brought back things from lecture three and, uh -huh. <clears throat> and lecture okay, two. Good. I, I had to think that they were old friends I'd forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Thank you. Alas, we only have time for one more question. Okay. I was just going to ask if you are considering or uh, looking at m maybe groups, uh, how, <laughs> how positive emotions, you know, so you talked about this reciprocal causation. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's some s theoretical stuff about the, uh, the amplifying effect yeah. of uh, you know these causal loops, right? But in a group, how that can be, the, the spirals negatively right. or positively can be, you know, right. amplified. Right. Uh, yeah. Great question. Um, my uh, training and background is so much in testing individuals that uh, the big uh, expanse <coughs> for me is to look at things dyadically. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Uh, I haven't yet uh, been bold enough to work with actual groups empirically, um, but I know the literature is there about how you know the, a leader's positive emotion can have a really big effect on the coherence and synchrony among people in, the, on, in uh, uh, making up the group. They can come to uh, coordinate their behavior better. Um, we've been lo looking at those microprocesses in dyadic inter interchanges where we. Um, create a sense of positive social connection between people and then see how behavioral coordination works after that. So I guess uh, my forte is to, is to really try to break things down to the micro level. So my group is two. <laughs> and uh, that's been occupying us for the last um, several years. We have a couple papers sort of in the works on the, those dyadic interchanges. So maybe in decade three, we'll hit groups. <laughs> so, but. Um, I, Absolutely, it's a very important area to look. And Losada's work on business teams really uh, helps underscore that. But I think teams and groups are a uh, very important place to go. And I, a number of doctoral students in business schools have been uh, taking on that challenge. It's just not one I've been doing in my own lab. So, but thanks for that uh, recognition. So. All good things come to a close. So. It's been a delight to have you with us. Thank it's you. It's been a delight to have people come and, and share this time with you. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We thank look you. forward to reading the book. Great.